we're going to be continuing in our series called Purpose that we have been in over the last few weeks, kicking off this new year, talking about what it looks like to walk in our calling and living out our purpose in God's mission. And as we've already talked about that uh, in the first week, we all have a specific purpose to fulfill in the mission of God. And then the last week, David talked to us about what our priority should be and that it's, we look at it as priorities, but we really have one singular priority. And so today we're going to be talking about what it looks like to live with intentionality when we think about purpose, when we think about walking in our calling and God's mission. And so as we get things kicked off today, um, I've probably, we've probably talked about this a little bit, but I was thinking kind of a great way to illustrate what it looks like to live intentionally. Do we have anybody that remembers going Black Friday shopping back when like it was like really a legit thing? It's not as much anymore, you know, they spread it out, but does anybody ever go like when you got up at like two in the morning to go like Black Friday shopping? So, okay, I got a few. We were crazy enough to do that a few times and uh I don't know, like every year I swore up and down it'd be my last year doing it. I'm like, I'm not doing this again. But it was something about the thrill. I don't know, it was kind of an adrenaline rush in a way uh, to do that. But those of you who did that, think back to the madness that was Black Friday. You know, people would be camped out on sidewalks for like weeks sometimes for this. They were getting in line. They want to make sure they got their stuff like... I don't know if Walmart still does it this way. I think they do. But I know years ago, they used to have like, they had everything in the store like mapped out and you could get like the map of where everything was going to be. I know the last time we, we did it when it was still crazy, they didn't give you a map. You just kind of had to figure things out. Um, but you know, many of you probably remember Black Friday, you're getting ready, you're prepping. What'd you do? You got the ad, you scoped out the ad, you looked to see what you wanted, you made a plan. You had to make a plan, right? Because like, if you didn't make a plan, you weren't getting your stuff. And, and so we made, made the plan. We'd go through it. We figured out where everything was going to be stationed. And we figured out what we needed to do to take advantage of as many of those Black Friday deals as possible. And if you've never been Black Friday shopping, you, like, you have no idea the craziness you've missed out on. But we had this thing that we were seeking. And so we had to make a plan that whatever it was we wanted, maybe it was multiple things, but we had to seize that opportunity. Why? Because we were made to feel like that opportunity was never going to come our way again. In fact, that's the way they advertise it. It's kind of like, hey, get this TV. We're going to heavily discount this thing. And if you don't get this, then hey, you're going to just miss out. And so we, maybe it was an Xbox or a PlayStation or whatever it was that we were looking for, but we were made to feel like we were never going to get that deal again if we didn't jump on it in that moment. And so I want you to keep that idea of, of in mind as we talk about living with intentionality. So today we're going to talk about the importance of that in our journey of following Jesus. And so in the hustle and the bustle of life and, and, and everything, it's really easy for you and me to get caught up in the, the demands of our culture. But however, as we study the word of God, we find that God calls us as his followers to something higher, to something greater, and that's to live with intentionality and to make the most of every opportunity. Because unlike Black Friday, there are literally moments in our lives that are one and done. We have one opportunity, one moment, and we don't ever know when those are going to be or what those are going to be, but there's that saying, you never get a second chance to make a first impression, and so that's true. Sometimes we don't get second chances <clears throat> to do things, and so we've got to make the most of every opportunity. So what does it mean to live? What does it mean to be intentional, to live with intentionality? Let's kind of define that before we jump into the text today. Well, intentional literally means something done with intention or something that is done on a purpose. It means that we, on purpose, have done something. It wasn't random. It wasn't just happenstance that there was a strategic purpose behind why we did what we did or when we did what we have done. And so we need to keep that in mind that intentionality is literally doing something with intention or doing something with purpose. So let's keep that in mind and let's jump into our text today. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. And I think this is a, a great passage for us to, to work through today because it's going to talk about some things that are important for us to be intentional about. 
And I think a lot of times, sometimes we hear the word intentional, intentionality, and we, we think of this idea of like, hey, seizing the day, living your best life now, and all these, these things. But I think as we study scripture, there's some things that we find in God's word that we are definitely supposed to be intentional about. And I think if we're going to walk in our purpose that God has for us in his mission, these are definitely going to be things we're looking at today that are vital for you and me to be intentional about. So let's jump into our text, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1. Here's the word of the Lord. Paul, the apostle, is writing to the church at Ephesus, and here's what he says. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, excuse me, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for saints. Obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks. For know and recognize this. Every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let, <clears throat> so, let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Pay careful attention then how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So as we get ready to work our way through this passage, I want to share this kind of overall arching uh, big idea that we're going to keep in mind as we think about living with intentionality. And it's this, it's at the bottom of your worship guide, but it says this, it says, there is no such thing as a meaningless moment. Everything we think, say, and do today matters forever. So just think about that. There's no such thing as a meaningless moment. Every moment of your life and my life has meaning, not just in the things we do or say, but even in the things that we think. And so let's keep that, in, that big idea in mind as we work our way through the verses that we just read. And let's talk about being intentional and living with intentionality. So let's jump into the text and work our way through that. Number one, we see when it comes to living intentionally is this. We intentionally walk in love as Christ has loved us. Look at verses one through two again. Paul is saying, therefore, that therefore is pointing back to the previous section, uh, the previous chapter and, and verses. And Paul is talking about what it looks like to have new life in Christ. He's talking about the new life that we have been giving. And then he's also talking about unity and diversity in the body of Christ. And then as he's talking about this new life, then he comes to chapter 5 and he says, Therefore, because of the new life that you have received in Jesus, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God. And he says, as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So we see that we intentionally walk in love as Christ has loved us. So let's, again, define some things. Love is, is not just a sentimental feeling. That's not what Paul's talking about when he says that we're to walk in love. He's not saying walk in this warm, fuzzy feeling that you get when you're around this person. Uh, that's not what really love is. That's not love at all. Uh, love is not just merely an emotional feeling that we have. True biblical love that you and I are called to walk in, that Jesus has loved us with, is a selfless <clears throat> sacrificial love. It's a love that acts. It's not a love that's based on warm and fuzzy feelings. 
<clears throat> so we intentionally choose love every single day. We choose to love our spouses. Now, we don't, <clears throat> some of us may or may not say this but, or admit this, but let's just be honest. Our spouses are not always easy to love, and we're not easy for our spouse to love. But yet, we choose. It's a choice. We choose to love. Because, again, <clears throat> this is one of the things that really is a problem in the American culture. People get married and have this idea that they're always going to feel a certain way about somebody else. And feelings are fickle and flighty, and they change from one moment to the next. And there are some days, like, I'm just going to be real. I don't feel things and you don't feel things, but we intentionally choose to love in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And so intentionally walking in love as Christ has loved us means that we are imitating, as Paul says, be imitators of God. We are imitating the selfless, sacrificial love of Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the one that enables us and empowers us to do that. Because apart from the Holy Spirit, you and I are not capable of that. Because as I've said before, let's just be honest, there are people that rub us the wrong way. There are people that we just don't like if we're being honest. And so if we base love on warm and fuzzy feelings and how I feel towards someone, it's going to be impossible for me to intentionally walk in love as Christ has loved me. And so it's a choice. It's a daily choice choice that is made that, yes, I'm going to do this because the spirit that lives within me gives me the ability and the power to do that. And so this kind of love, it involves us giving ourselves away for the good of others. Walking in love as Christ has loved us involves us giving ourselves away for the good of others. It, it means that, again, it's, it's not about me it's not about you. It's about us living our lives in such a way that we give them away because we know that giving our life away is going to bring good in someone else's life. It's for their good. And so it involves us giving, and it doesn't involve us taking. But also, as we think on Christ's love for us, and we meditate on that. And, and I'm going to be real for, with you for just a few moments on that. Like, I, I don't think we really do that enough. I, I think that no matter how much we meditate on, on it and, and dwell on it, I don't think we can ever grasp the depth, the height, the breadth of God's love for us through Christ. But I think so often because we, we understand we'll never fully comprehend, I, I don't think we live in that moment and dwell on that enough. And the more we dwell on that, it, it should overwhelm us. And it should not only overwhelm us because of our sinfulness and who Jesus is, but it should overwhelm us and cause us to grow in our love for others. Why? Because Christ loved us when we were unlovable, when we didn't deserve it, when we were in sin, when we were enemies of God. And so we intentionally <clears throat> choose daily to walk in love as Christ has loved us. But then there's a second thing Paul talks about in this passage that, that we have to be intentional about as followers of Jesus if we're going to fulfill our purpose in God's mission. And number two is this, we intentionally turn away from darkness and embrace the light of Christ. We intentionally turn away from darkness and we embrace the light of Christ. And we see that in verses 3 through 14. And we're going to spend a, a little bit of time here dealing with these, these verse, what's dealt with in these verses. Paul mentions several sins that describe darkness. And in fact, later in the chapter, Paul doesn't ever say that we walked in darkness. He fact, in fact, he says we were darkness. We weren't just walking in it. We were darkness by our sin and our actions. But Paul mentions several different sins here that describe darkness. He mentions sexual immorality, purity, greed, obscene and foolish speech or, or crude speech, or and idolatry. Now, we, we look at that list and, and we think, well, when we think of sexual immorality, we live in a culture now that's kind of redefining what that, that looks like. Uh, sexual immor immorality is anything that is outside of the sexual relationship of a husband and a wife in the confines of marriage. 
And any sexual relationship outside of that is sexual immorality. And so we live in a culture that kind of tries to redefine that, and sadly the church has allowed it to be redefined as well when Scripture is very clear about that. Impurity literally is talking about that, that how we are called to, to live holy lives as, as God is holy. We are called to be holy, and impurity kind of can feed back into sexual morality, but it can also go into other areas as well. Greed. Greed is, is something that maybe we even think that we don't struggle with, but greed ultimately is a heart issue. Greed is not necessarily about just wanting more money. It's, it's a contentment issue that what I have is not enough. Obscene and, and foolish or crude speech. And, and Paul says that these are things that are not proper for the saints. These are things that we shouldn't be doing, meaning we should not be using obscene and crude speech. But then he goes on and later he talks about idolatry. And I think when we hear that word idolatry, most of us look at it and kind of think, I'm all right. I don't have any wooden, I don't have a wooden statue in my house that I bow down to and I pray to, but our idols in our culture are so much more subtle and so much more dangerous because we think we're not worshiping idols, but in reality, we've made idols out of almost everything in our culture. We've made idols out of relationships, out of sports, out of entertainment. We've made idols even out of Bible translations. Or we've made idols out of things within a building where the church gathers. We make idols out of everything. An idol is is literally something that we basically have an allegiance to or a devotion to. And anything can be an idol. But then Paul also gives us a warning. Down here in verse Number uh, five, when he says this, for know and recognize this. He says, every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So we're given a really strong and solemn warning here from Paul. And we don't like to talk about things like this because this doesn't sound very warm and fuzzy. This doesn't sound like something that's going to be super encouraging to us, but it's something that is important for us to grasp. That we are given this warning that those who persist in darkness will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he gives that list of sins. So let me clarify something. It doesn't mean that he's not talking about that if we fall into sin and we go out of here and we, one of us, commits adultery tomorrow, that we're lost and we're going for judgment. He's not talking about that. When he says, he's talking about persisting, when he says that these people who do, he says, do these things. He's talking about living a lifestyle. And what that means is, is that Living a lifestyle of sin or living a lifestyle of darkness means that that characterizes my entire life, not just a snapshot of one moment, but over the course of my entire life, I've lived in such a way where I don't demonstrate repentance. I don't demonstrate that there's any conviction in my life about the sin in my life. He's saying if I persist in that, so like if I were to to commit adultery and then I say I'm good and I persist in that adultery, Paul's saying, I don't have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or of God. And then in fact, he goes on to to not only say there's not an inheritance, but in verse six, he says, let no one deceive you with empty arguments for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. So Paul warns us. He says that not only do we not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or of God, we see that God's judgment and wrath is going to fall upon people who are in darkness. And so we intentionally turn away from the darkness and embrace the light of Christ. And so this involves something, this is something that we have to do daily. This involves some things on our part. And, And some of the things this involves is, number one, transparency. It involves us being honest. And it involves us being daily committed to repentance. And so I need to be honest about the fact that I'm not perfect. You need to be honest about the fact you're not perfect. We need to be transparent about the fact that we struggle with sin. 
We need to be intentional about that, that yes, we don't have our stuff together like we try to make everyone think we have our stuff together. We've given the world and the culture around us this false idea that when we came to faith in Jesus, that somehow when God radically changed our hearts and saved us, that somehow we're perfect and we're super spiritual now and we don't ever struggle with sin, that we're perfect. And that's nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I would say this, I think at that point the struggle becomes greater because at this point we're aware of the sin. When we commit the sin, we like beat ourselves. I'm, maybe you're not this way, but when I do something intentionally that I know I shouldn't do and I'm like, man, why did I do this? That was so stupid. Like, what were you thinking? Come on. Like, you know this is not right. You know this is wrong. And yet, here I am. Paul's not talking about that. He's saying when we live in a lifestyle and we persist in a lifestyle and there's no conviction, there's no repentance. He's saying that there's going to be wrath and there's going to be judgment that's going to happen. And we can't escape that. Like, we don't need to dwell on that. See, there, we fall into one of two ditches on the side of the road here. You hear that saying, people tell you, keep it between the ditches. Stay, I mean, they stay on the road. Don't get over here and don't get over here. But what happens is, in our culture, in our church culture, we like to, to focus in one of two areas. Usually, the church will go way off to this end and say, well, God's a loving God and there would never be judgment. God's never going to judge sin. God's God loves everyone. There's no such thing as a place called hell. And there's never a such thing that God ever uh, intended for eternal judgment. For any, Everyone's going to be okay because God is love. And that's a ditch. But then there's another ditch on this side of the road to where we focus on nothing but God's wrath and God's judgment. And there are people, believe it or not, I have actually met that somehow, like this is kind of sick and twisted and messed up, but it's almost like they, they, they say they're a Christian, but when you talk to them, they give you the idea that somehow, like they're excited about God judging people and pouring his wrath out on people. I, I've heard people say stuff like, man, oh, talking about hell and talking about like all this person, you know, they're going to go there and they're going to they're gonna suffer and they're going to get what they deserve. And they sound like they're enjoying that. And that's also wrong in a ditch. And here's the thing, we don't have to like always tell people, hey, you better turn before you burn. We just need to preach the gospel and be intentional about that. But we need to talk about judgment and we do need to talk about wrath because it's coming. But we're going to see that that actually still applies to us as Christians about judgment here in a moment. But when we think about being honest, we think about being transparent and committed to repentance as we daily intentionally turn away from darkness and embrace this light of Christ. This involves us committing to daily exposing the works of darkness by shining the light of Christ on them. And I'm not talking about shining the light of Christ on your neighbor. I'm talking about shining the light of Christ on your own heart and exposing the works of darkness within us. It starts with us because I need to be worried about the darkness that resides in my own heart and I need to worry about my own sin and dealing with that. And so how do I do that? How do I daily expose the works of darkness that's in my own heart? Well, that happens as I spend time in God's Word. As I am in God's Word every day, and I'm reading, and I'm applying it to my life, I'm exposing the darkness that resides in my own heart. So I have to spend time in God's Word. I have to apply it to my life. And then I have to obediently live out the truth that I have just been exposed to. And as I'm doing that, I am daily exposing the work of darkness in my own life. And I need to intentionally daily turn from that and embrace the light of Christ. And daily you need to intentionally expose the works of darkness in your own heart and turn from that and embrace the light of Christ. That's what we call repentance. And it's just, and it's a daily thing. Daily, we have to repent. Sometimes, maybe, I don't know, if I'm in traffic, it might be more than daily. It might be moment by moment because uh, that, that's, that's my struggle. I, I, can, I can get road rage with the best of them. But we intentionally turn from darkness and embrace the light of Christ. Let me give you the third thing. Number three, we intentionally make the most of our time in this world. We intentionally make the most of our time in this world. Let's look at verses 15 through 17. Paul says this, 
He says, pay careful attention then to how you walk. He says, not as unwise people, but as wise. Then he says, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So intentionality involves a thoughtful and a discerning approach to the way we live our lives. How many of us, the older we are getting, realize how valuable and how precious time really is when we think about it? Absolutely. Time is a precious gift, and we realize the older we... You ever? I was talking to someone the other day, you know, we talk about how the older we get, how time seems like it, it, it goes faster. And, and I'm probably going to butcher the way this was explained, but I think I can remember it. But I was reading somewhere about this that they said the reason why as we get older, it seems that time moves faster is because we actually have more of a life to look back on and point on. So when we're younger, we've not lived as long. And so to us, it does feel like time is moving slower. But as we get older and we've lived more, it gives us the appearance that time is actually moving faster when time never really has moved slower or faster. Time moves at the same speed. But our perception of how time moves changes as we get older. Why? Because, think about it. If you have lived to be 40 years old, you are already on the back half of your life according to average life expectancy in our world. In this country, you are already on the back 50% of your life if you're 40 or over. That's kind of a sobering thought to think about, you know. And even if you're 35, you're pretty close to it. Um, like that's, that's sobering when you think about that at 35, I've lived probably almost half my life, you know, by the average statistics. But time is a precious gift and it me and it living with intentionality means that we are using our time that we've been given wisely. David shared with us last week, he said, you know, what reveals our priority in life is, is two things. He said, how we spend our time and how we spend our money. And that's exactly true. Sometimes I don't spend my time well. Sometimes I don't steward my time well. And sometimes I waste my time and don't use it like I should. And I don't view it as a precious commodity that I'm never going to get back. See, the use of our time is not neutral. It's not a neutral thing. We're either using our time, as Paul says, making the most of it, realizing that the days are evil, or we're just squandering our time, not really giving a, having a care in the world, not realizing that we'll never get those moments back again. Remember, we said there's no, you never get a first chance to make a second, or a second chance to make a first impression. There's some moments in life. We look back on and they're gone. We're not going to get a do-over. There is no mulligan. They're, they're gone. And so we need to look at each moment of life. And, and I wonder in my own, and I even say this to myself because so many times I get up and I'm guilty of just thinking tomorrow, man, tomorrow's Monday. Here's what I got to do. Boom, boom, boom. And I just go through the motions. It's Monday. And I don't live with intentionality. See, we live in a culture of distractions and we live in a culture that is just bombarding us with busyness. Being busy does not, is, is actually the opposite of being intentional. You, um, I saw, please don't nobody shoot me if you, know, if you happen to know where I'm referring to, but I saw a church sign on the way coming up the road and it talked about a busy church being a growing church. And I saw that and I was like, that's terrible. That's so not true. We can be busy with the wrong things and it doesn't mean we're growing. We can be busy in our walk with Jesus, like just doing things like Martha. We can be Martha and busy, and she was doing things that were great and needful and good, but she was missing out on the most important thing, which was just being at the feet of Jesus. Just because we're busy doesn't mean we're growing. I can be busy with a lot of stuff that really doesn't amount to anything. But making the most of our time involves us Doing the will of God, as Paul says here in verse 17. He says, so don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, I want to ask a question for you just to think about. What do you think about? And you don't have to answer this out loud, but just a question to ponder. What do we think about when we think of the will of God? 
What comes to mind? I don't, I'll share my experience with, with you on this. So for us, the background we came out of, when we were talking about the will of God, it was always presented as this mysterious thing that we had to figure out and we had to discover. Like God had this mysterious will for us for every little minute detail of our lives. And, and what I mean by this, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that to discredit that I do believe that God uses all things in our lives. And I don't think there's anything in our life that God doesn't allow, doesn't use, or that God's not sovereignly reigning over. But sometimes we can get really nitpicky with that. And, and I say this tongue in cheek, like, okay, Lord, what, what is your will, God, for me concerning buying this car? Lord, which car is your perfect will for me to buy? Is it the Honda or is it the Kia? And we'll even get down to small Things like, and we were even taught stuff like that, like, hey, and, and if you don't choose the right one, be careful because you're out of God's will. And I say that tongue in cheek, but like it was seriously that nitpicky that like, hey, if you don't choose the right one here, you're out of God's will. And so let's talk about what, what does it mean to know God's will and to, to do God's will when we think about making the most of our time? Well, let's, let's look at what scripture says. What does scripture say about what God's will is for us? So listen to these verses as I read them. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Paul says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. <clears throat> Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. It's God's will that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service or our true worship. It's God's will that we would not be conformed to this age, but that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, Paul says, For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. God's will for us is that we would be sanctified, meaning that we are continually looking more and more like Jesus every day and that he is changing us from the inside out, that God is sanctifying us. That's God's will, that we would continue to grow in holiness and, and grow in closeness with looking like Jesus. And then we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will is that we would rejoice always, that we would constantly pray, and that we would give thanks in everything. Those are some of the things that we can discern from Scripture, knowing that, yes, this is God's will for my life and for your life. And I don't have to like try to figure out what God's will is like it's a mysterious, vague thing that's out there somewhere that we've got to discover. If you are a follower of Jesus today, that is God's will for you. And it's God's will for me that we would do that. But we have to understand that intentionally doing the will of God may not always be accepted by the church culture. It may not be accepted by the, the secular culture around us either. But intentionally doing the will of God may not always be accepted by those around us. And so let's get ready to kind of wrap up today as we, we talk about what it looks like to live with intentionality. See, living with intentionality begins with you and me surrendering our plans and our actions to the Lord. That's where it begins. It begins with us surrendering our our plans, our actions, our ambitions, our desires to the Lord. But see, sadly, we often live our lives as if it's all about us. David said that again last week. Your life is not about you. My life is not about me. Living with intentionality, it forces us to confront the idols in our culture of selfishness and self-centeredness. And those are major idols that we all have. Because why? We have a bent, a bent and a leaning towards being selfish people. It's just part of the fall. It's part of, of, of the, 
of what we inherited from Adam and Eve after the fall, that we just have a propensity towards being selfish and being self-centered. But living with intentionality means that we are constantly keeping our focus on three things. And I want to share these three things just quickly and we, as we close. Living with intentionality means that you and I are keeping our focus on number one, the narrow way. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. Living with intentionality means that we keep our focus on the narrow way. We have blinders. We have tunnel vision. Why? Because Jesus tells us that the road that leads to eternal life is not broad and wide. It is extremely narrow. And I don't know about you, but the more I've spent time in Scripture and the more I read God's Word, the more I realize there's a whole lot of people sitting in church buildings week after week after week. And they're not on the narrow way. Why? Because Jesus says that the way is narrow. And he says there's not going to be many people that find it. And he says that broad is the way. And there's going to be a whole lot of people that are going to find that. But living with intentionality also means that we are constantly keeping our focus on, secondly, the cross. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25, Jesus says this to them, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit or what does it profit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself or in some translations or if he loses his soul or he forfeits his soul? Jesus says that we are to live with intentionality by keeping our focus on the narrow way. We keep our focus on the cross. Jesus is literally calling us to deny ourselves. And this is one of the things that's important for us to understand in this church culture is that when Jesus says, If anyone will come after me, let him take up his cross daily, deny himself, and follow me. That was an invitation to die. In that culture, Jesus was literally giving them the invitation when he said, come follow me. It was an invitation to surrender their life and die for the sake of the gospel. But we don't look at it that way. We don't view the cross, the invitation, as something where Jesus is saying, Surrender your life. Sacrifice your life. Die to yourself. And then the third thing, living intention, with intentionality means that we are constantly keeping our focus on standing before the Lord. We're keeping our focus on the narrow way, the cross, and standing before the Lord. See, there are two judgments that are going to happen. The Bible speaks of the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. And if we are a follower of Jesus, we will be present at the judgment seat of Christ, as Scripture says, to give an account for everything that we have said, we have done, we have even thought, and we're going to give an account. And we see in 1 Corinthians that Paul, or 1st or 2nd Corinthians that Paul talks about, I'm drawing a blank on which book off the top of my head, but he talks about that there's going to be some of us that we're going to be saved, but he talks about being saved by fire. And it means that we're going, to be, we're going to be saved. Yes, we'll be there. But he's saying a lot of our works are going to be burned up. Guys, when I think about living with intentionality, I think that you and I need to keep at the forefront of our minds every single moment of every single day that one day we're going to stand before Jesus at the judgment seat. We're going to give an account for everything, not just we've said or we've done, but even the things we've thought. Because Jesus equates thoughts with the same as actions. And when we think about that, that's a scary, sobering thought. How's it going to be when we stand before Jesus at the judgment seat and we give an account for how we have lived our lives and how we've spent our time? That's a really sobering thought. And so I want to invite you to stand today. And we want, I want to give us a moment, some time as we sing together to respond. I don't know about you, but something I've really been burdened about is in my own life, as I think about 
living with intentionality, as I think about purpose and I think about time and I think about this life, what am I doing with the time God's given me? What am I doing with the life he's given me to live? How am I using it for him? Because I need to realize that there are things about it I need to be intentional about every day. All of us, we need to be intentional about walking in love as Christ has loved us. We need to be intentional about daily turning from darkness, daily turning from sin and repenting and confessing that sin. And we need to be intentional about daily making the most of every opportunity. We're starting a brand new year. We're about to finish our first month. That's my prayer for us as a church family this year, moving into 2024, that we would live with intentionality corporately as a church, but that as individuals, we would live with intentionality in those areas that Paul talked about. And so I don't know how God's been speaking to you today, but I pray that we would respond in repentance and faith and that we would respond as God has spoken to our hearts about being intentional as we sing together.